Today's talk is actually one that's very dear to me. Um, I spent two years being unemployed uh, while I was living in Denmark, and I decided that I don't want to go through that experience. So for the next five years or so, I spent a lot of time focusing on picking up uh, skills that would be attractive to um, employers. And among those skills were coding. Um, among those skills were also uh, data science, data analytics, machine learning. So this is really a success story on my end. Um, and I'm hoping to share with you kind of the journey that I took to get here where I am today. So let's start off with a little timeline. Uh, in 2013, I graduated um, within a bachelor's degree in marketing. I despised marketing. Uh, I did my internship at Microsoft in Denmark as well. And um, I was really frustrated at how much at the mercy of your manager you actually were. And uh, especially with decision making, should we do X or should we do Z? And um, I just grew frustrated and I didn't know why. I didn't know there was like a better way of doing things. So um, right after when I finished my internship, I got offered two jobs, one at Microsoft to continue within marketing um, and another with Ubisoft, which is the games industry. Uh, and the one in Ubisoft was within business analysis. So I thought, okay, maybe that's going to help with my frustration. Um, so I spent a year and a half working day to day uh, within a spreadsheet. And you get to become more frustrated with spreadsheets because they are so untidy. They are so, you know, you can't uh, store everything and they crash and you have to start all over. And it, it was a horrible experience. So after one and a half years of frustration, it wasn't all bad, I'm kind of exaggerating. But uh, after uh, a year and a half with uh, working uh, within uh, Excel spreadsheets and Google Sheets, um, I kind of understood the limitations. So you know how Excel spreadsheets have like this limit of one million rows, and if you try and add more, it's kind of just crash. So I started taking courses uh, about how to use SQL. Um, like Tammy was mentioning before, here they also have a course about you know, SQL for, and data analytics because that's the next step if your data set becomes too big. So I went into data analysis and got offered a job here in the UK. So I moved away from Denmark where I had grown up and uh, came over to the UK to work as a, sen a senior data analyst. Within the first couple of months, I started asking so many questions. What's our monetization strategy? How do we plan on acquiring users? How do we plan on retaining users? And uh, it was a bit of a nuisance, but in a good way, because when you come in with a business mindset uh, into data analysis, you can actually see it from both perspectives. You don't have a technical mindset, you have more this business mindset. So uh, I quickly got promoted to a product manager. And product management is a really interesting combination Every company has a completely different understanding of what a product manager is. Uh, some of you may already work as a product manager, others are looking to get into it, but there's no really clear definition of what product management is, especially in software and technology. So I started managing the important KPIs, uh, the metrics of the company, uh, and uh, did a lot of A-B testing to improve them, which led me to become this lead product manager. And around in 2017, I, uh, we actually got acquired by a larger company. And this larger company did not need product managers. So um, they asked me to transition into a data scientist position. <coughs> so that was actually for the past six months or seven months um, before joining Expedia here a, a month and a half ago. I've been working as a marketing data scientist. Um, and that is really uh, the coolest thing to be able to transition into a role uh, as the company needs you. Uh, and I think that's one of the key elements that I got from marketing. You know, uh, it's not that good to have too many specialists in a company because if a company changes direction, then you need to be able to change with it. So I was very fortunate to have that skill set and not actually be made redundant. Um, so, and here I am today. So I've been here in London for a month and a half. And uh, I now work uh, within Hotels.com, which is part of Expedia Group, uh, where I manage their machine learning and AI capabilities. And this is purely self-taught, um, and I'm planning on sharing some of the insight with you. Uh, 
I, I don't want to overhype uh, the transition into data science because it is painful as hell. There's no easy way to go about doing it. But I do plan on sharing with you um, the skill set that's needed and how to actually get there. So first of all, before we even talk about machine learning, um, I thought I may list some points as to why it's important for uh, aspiring product managers or current product managers to um, actually understand machine learning and beyond just the concepts, but really get a grasp of machine learning. The future products are all going to be something that has machine learning in them, either powered by machine learning, I'm going to talk about how that could look like in a bit, um, and that is going to be a requirement for any company that wants to uh, remain competitive, uh, especially in software and technology. And you are seeing machine learning all over the landscape. I was reading about how agriculture now uses machine learning, how it uses uh, computer vision to be able to separate tomatoes, uh, like uh, ripe tomatoes from uh, green tomatoes, and that's all done using computer vision. And so every industry is being transformed by machine learning, and we should not be the ones that are falling behind on, on this uh, machine learning train. And also, this is actually a very important point that you have to develop products and features as a product manager. It's often uh, with you that the ideas come up. Let's do this, why don't we do that based on this? So you need to actually understand what machine learning does, how it works, and also um, what opportunities um, you can apply it to. So if you don't have that, you, you are very, very uh, hamstrung because you have to rely on some technical person to come up with those ideas for you. And also it will allow you to identify some low-hanging machine learning fruits. It's a weird concept. But um, these, these opportunities where you can, if you just apply machine learning here, you can get a big impact or return on investment. Um, so it, it helps you actually spot and identify these opportunities. Um, and more importantly, uh, like uh, I've, I had a meeting at one of my uh, pre, uh, um, jobs and one person was saying, yeah, why don't we build a robot and that robot can then go and analyze the environment and then update us. Like, Are you insane? I mean, that's what Facebook uh, you know, works on these projects because they have hundreds of data scientists. So you need to be able to understand what's actually feasible. What can we uh, task our engineers with within reasonable about amount of time? Uh, so it's gonna help you with prioritization as well. And more importantly, uh, the hype. Uh, when I interviewed with Expedia, um, the director of data science, he told me, okay, so can you tell me about something, uh, you know, about machine learning that uh, we should be doing? And so I, I engaged with him and answered a lot of these questions. And then he said, um, how do you go about separating the hype from actual features? Because that's a real issue. And it's bigger issue for product managers because if you don't have the in-depth knowledge, you're just going to be reading the news uh, and, you know, uh, thinking that Skynet is coming to take over the world and all of this um, oversaturated focus on certain aspects of machine learning. And um, especially when it comes to deep learning, uh, which I'm going to be talking about in a bit, don't start with deep learning if you want to uh, learn machine learning. Um, so you, you'll be able to navigate the hype and actually understand where to apply it to. And yeah, you want to stay alive, so you better use it in your product because you, for a fact it's certain that your competitors does the same. And I think this is actually one of my personal uh, motivations. As I said before, I spent two years being unemployed. It was a horrible experience. Um, and I decided I never want to go back to that in my life. So. Uh, you always want to be as marketable as possible to recruiters and these are skills if you master them beyond the hype that open up so many doors for you. And yeah, that's why the, the final point is there as well. Um, which means you'll always be able to actually find work if something happens to your company. So three types of machine learning. Um, I'm going to be focusing most of my time on supervised machine learning. Um, unsupervised learning, I'm just going to touch that a bit. And reinforcement learning, uh, I'm going to cover it with regards to 
uh, something called multi-arm bandits. You may have heard of that. Um, basically, uh, hypothesis testing and how it can apply to it. These are what is generally accepted as machine learning. Notice I don't have deep learning there. Uh, computer vision, all of these things, they're not part of uh, like traditional machine learning. Um, the reason why is because deep learning fits under artificial intelligence and there is, this is a big mess, uh, <coughs> there are no clear definitions between what exactly artificial intelligence is versus uh, neural networks and machine learning. But this is generally accepted for machine learning and I'll show you some of the powers of using them in your products and um, I'll show you some of the competitions I've participated in myself and how you can you know, apply it to very interesting problems. So let's get started. Supervised machine learning sounds extremely fancy, but in all honesty, what it is is just one big spreadsheet with this added column right here. So this is a competition I participated in whether uh, so the, the competition was whether we could predict when a Brazilian patient was going to cancel their medical appointment. And what this shows is every person, this is uh, one row, has a particular, uh, some like this is their age, uh, scholarship, hypertension, some uh, disease here, diabetes, whether they have them or not, uh, alcoholism and what level of handicap and whether they received a, an SMS reminding them, oh, you know, you have an appointment tomorrow, come attend. And when they were scheduled for and when the appointment date was. So they give you this big data set, including what gender they were. And so what you have to do is analyze it and see whether you can actually predict whether a particular person, so if you imagine we remove this column and you receive every uh, column from M to A, but not the N. Can you then predict whether that person is going to cancel their medical appointment or not? And um, I built a model within 97% accuracy that could predict whether someone was going to um, cancel their appointment. And so this was a really cool way of actually separating the hype away from machine learning. Supervised machine learning. How many of you actually thought, oh, it's just a spreadsheet? I mean, it sounds really cool. You, don't cheat, Joshua. <laughs> um, so it sounds really cool, but uh, in all honesty, what it is, is just a spreadsheet where you have a final target label. This is what it's called. And that target label is what you're trying to predict. So um, this is how classification looks like. You, in classification, you want to predict one or zero. One is if the event happens, right? So here it says no, yes. So then you spend a lot of time cleaning that so that no is zero and yes is one. And then you want to predict that one. How many of those patients actually will end up having that one? Does that make sense? That's classification. Is this going to happen or not going to happen? Um, that's very different from, let's say, in financial work where you want to predict how much revenue we are going to uh, forecast, uh, sorry, we are going to generate, right? Because that's a big number that you're trying to predict. Here you're trying to predict whether a certain outcome will take place. I want you to try and expand uh, your, your uh, mindset here around classification. This could also mean you guys, you went to product school's website for this event. Okay, so we ha oh, they have your IP address. They know uh, which country you're from. They know your internet connection speed. Imagine all of those things actually being part of these columns. Um, how long you spend time on Product School's website and whether or not you signed up to this event. This is how it actually uh, looks like. So I could build a predictive model using supervised machine learning, which is classification in this particular incident, to predict whether you would have attended this uh, session or not. So that's how uh, to go about identifying opportunities for machine learning. Are you dealing with uh, a feature, um, a solution you're trying to solve for where you, you really need to know whether a certain event is going to happen in the future based on some data you have? Then it's classification. <coughs> Regression is um, 
It's not playing ball. Okay, yeah. So regression is, like I said, revenue or it's these um, continuous numbers. Um, so on a scale from one to one million, that's what you're trying to predict an actual value. So this is another competition that I participated in, um, a Kaggle competition, if you've heard of those, where you have the day of the year over a two year period and what season it was, whether it was a holiday or not, what weekday it was, whether it was a working day or not, what the weather situation was like, the temperature, uh, humidity, wind speed, um, all of these different va variables. And then the target value here you're trying to predict is how many people uh, rent a bike to go to work. So can you predict what the actual number is for people uh, split by day for the next two years? How many of them are going to be taking their bike to work? And you can. This is what it's so powerful. Uh, 92% accuracy uh, for a user. So if you imagine you are sitting in this bike sharing company in uh, Washington in the States and a user comes to you, you've never seen that person before. You just ask that user certain questions. Um, so you're gonna check, well actually you don't have to use them. Uh, you can check what the temperature is, you can check the wind speed and whether it's a weekday or not. And those, only those three features have such a high uh, uh, weight on whether that person is going to be booking a ride or not. So, so that's how you end up predicting uh, how many people will use this. Does that make sense? Cool. So I really wanted to show you hands-on and I wanted to go even deeper and uh, I had hoped that I could tell you guys, hey, bring your laptops, you know, we'll do a code along session, but uh, I think that's gonna be too complex. So I, I wanted to show you how it looks like um, from the perspective of how a data scientist actually works. So do you remember the data set about predicting a medical appointment, whether that person is going to uh, cancel that appointment or not? This was actually my uh, final project for one of the degrees I was doing, well, pseudo uh, online course degrees. And um, this is to show you how it looks like from a data scientist perspective when that person sits with a data set. Okay, so they receive a data set. Uh, so you see this is a CSV file, comma separated file. It's like a big spreadsheet basically. You load that into Python so that the data is available to you. Very similar. But you notice there are a lot of mistakes here. So the interesting part about machine learning is machines are really, really dumb. They don't know the difference between F and M. So you need to transform uh, the entire data set. This is why data scientists are so um, and annoyed and angry sometimes when you speak to them because 80% of their work is just cleaning data. And what that means is, we'll say uh, F for females, we're gonna change that to say one, and M for males, we're gonna uh, change that to say zero, right? And so every time you see one, it means a female because computers can only uh, read one and zero, at least most of the machine learning algorithms. So you need to clean up the data set. This doesn't work either, this is a big mess so schedule day versus appointment day. But instead what you can do is what I'll show you uh, later, is you can take those two dates and subtract them from each other to identify how many dates were there from when the date uh, from the uh, appointment was scheduled to the appointment day. Because you have to think creatively about what could be good features. Now features in machine learning just means variables. This is a variable, this is another variable, this is uh, a third variable. So you have to think long and hard. And even, and I understand this may be a bit abstract, this doesn't work either. You can't use that to predict whether someone is going to cancel their appointment. So that needs to be trans, uh, uh, transformed into numbers as well. So maybe Mata di Praia could be five, and Jadim da Peña, however you pronounce it, could be 200. It has to be numbers. Machines don't understand anything else. Uh, and so after you do that transitioning, um, you also have to check if there's any data missing. In my case, there wasn't anything missing. Um, so this is where I do the actual data wrangling. 
M, male, is 1. I want you to change that. And female is 0. Um, and then store that. Uh, and then what I also want to do is I noticed there were some typos. It said hypertension with an I up here, the columns. Um, yeah, you see hyper. So I'm just going to clean it up a bit. Um, this is from my GitHub account. Uh, so I clean up the data set so it looks a bit uh, more tidy. And uh, what I then do is I'm, I'm going to be adding, instead of it saying yes, no, whether a patient showed up, if the value I want to predict, it always has to be one. So uh, no show meaning one means that a person did not show up. Every time the, the value that you want to predict has to be one. And zero is the uh, class that we uh, are not that interested in. And then I look at the distribution. So how many zeros? So how many people attended or showed up for their medical appointment? Okay, that's 88,000. And how many people canceled? It was 22,000. Um, so yeah, that's 20% of my records that did not show up or 22% or 20% of patients that didn't show up. And so you also, this is the most important aspect, and this is where a lot of junior data scientists get it wrong, is they don't explore the data set. So here I'm, I'm, I'm looking at the age range. And if you notice, there is something weird. Can anyone tell me what's weird about the age range here? So this is the smallest value, and this is the largest value for medical patients that have canceled their appointments. Anyone? That's a very good point. Anything else? Yes, another. It's a very good point. So there are a zero year old, um, or maybe even a 115 year old. So these are what you call in statistics outliers. Think about it from a perspective of statistics. You want to build a model that's going to predict, based on age and a lot of other variables, whether a person is going to cancel their appointment. But in that data set, you have these extreme outliers. They're going to ruin your model and it's going to make it less useful. So you have to delete those records. That's one way. You can try and predict what they actually would have been, you know, because sometimes it's a manual type error like a human was entering, oh, you are this old, you are that old. So you can try and predict what the actual value is. But these are some of the considerations data scientists have to make. Um, and then I'm trying to visualize it. Okay, so because we only have a few people that are above the age of 100, let's get rid of them from the data set because they are going to skew the model entirely and make it, uh, make it uh, less useful. Um, so this is basically, I'm trying to show you how a data scientist thinks about the data and, um, and how you visualize it. So when you get further down, um, notice here that the agenda is now changed, zero and one. And uh, further down here as well, after I'm doing some more cleaning, you'll identify this process here. So this is days delta. Days delta basically means from the day they booked the appointment to the day they uh, had the appointment, how many days were in between them? Do you think that could play a role in whether someone was to cancel or not? What do you think? Yes. What about if they didn't receive an SMS and they had booked 15 days ago? Do you think there could be like a correlation between that? It's a very leading question. Uh, so, but this wasn't available in the data set, so it's something you have to create yourself. Uh, so. I'm, I'm, I hope this was a bit of a helpful exercise. Um, and I can go on for ages here and talk about it. But basically, that's the process of cleaning data uh, for data scientists uh, to build a model that can predict how accurate it is. So back to the presentation. In fact, one of the most important concepts in data science, and this actually blew my mind when I learned about it the first time, how do you take historical data and predict on unseen data, like new uh, future uh, uh, examples of patients coming in? How does that work? So in classification, this is how hacky those data scientists have been thinking. What they do is they will take, let's say, 20% of the data set. Uh, I've only t t taken 10 uh, 
patients here. So they take 20% of the data set, remove it, okay? And then build a model with all of these target variables available to them. And because we know for the final two, or for the final 20%, what the actual value is, we are not gonna tell our machine learning model what the values are. So we are gonna treat them as new people coming, uh, new people having booked and we want to evaluate whether they are going to cancel their appointment or not. So we hide it from the machine, but we know what the truth is. And after you build your model, you then test and see how accurate it got those predictions. That's how machine learning actually works. Uh, you always take a bit of the data you have, you separate it, that's called the test data set. You have the train, this is the 80%, for example. And you take a holdout data set, the test data set, and you know what the actual answers to, them, uh, to, the, to, the, uh, to, to the test data are, but you are going to obfuscate that to the AI. Um, and you're going to tell them, well, I don't know whether these people are going to show up or not. So you tell me, and then you can double check if, they, if, if the machine learning model actually said, no, they are going to cancel, and no, the other person is also going to cancel, you know you have a very accurate model. Make sense? Okay, so. Quick question, I guess they would spend a lot of time thinking which 20%, right, to make okay. a uh, very good. kind of Sample, right? Very, very good question. And uh, this is, um, so within machine learning, you have this concept of, I I'm not going to cover it, uh, actually I don't have any slides to cover it in my talk today, but the concept here is, do you just take the bottom 20%, do you take the first, or do you randomize it? So you can randomize it, you can shuffle it, so this is what some of these machine learning uh, um, models do. What they do is they say, all right, I actually don't know whether those uh, uh, you know, patients you have given me is in some order, because if they are in some order, that's very dangerous. You could have removed something from a data set uh, you know, that's uh, already ordered, and so your model is going to be very biased. So what they do is they shuffle, okay, row uh, 11 is going to be two, two is going to be three. They shuffle it all around and then they take randomized uh, samples here and there. That's one of the ways of doing it. Um, another way, which is, bear with me if it's a bit abstract. One of the ways that machine learning, uh, some, for, for example, in Python, uh, does any of you uh, know how to code just a bit in Python? Anyone? Okay, <laughs> cool. Okay, so in Python what you can do is you take the 20% away and you build the model, right? And then you evaluate it on those 20% and then you put the data back. And then you take a different 20%, evaluate on those and put them back so that you never actually lose any data. You're just trying to evaluate the model from many different uh, uh, perspectives. Does that make sense? Um, if this is something of interest to you, it's. Uh, after the talk, just let me know and I can show you uh, proper examples of how it works. Um, but it, it's, it's a very powerful uh, um, way of solving that problem. It's like uh, A-B testing, you know, you, do, you don't just say, oh, every male that sees this website, you see this variant, every female sees that variant. That's not, never going to happen. So you randomize it so that your results are going to be more uh, uh, solid. This is not really a fact, but something well known. Um, the reason why I'm not going to cover deep learning is because it's only applicable to very limited um, problems. Okay, I attended a talk in uh, Copenhagen where the data scientists were saying, we deployed deep learning on this and on that, and you're like, what the hell are you doing? Uh, uh, you're basically just a big buzzword because the, uh, deep learning is uh, getting beaten in performance by, um, oops, by uh, many of these uh, algorithms like decision trees, uh, XGBoost, random forest. Uh, it's getting beaten on performance and on accuracy for supervised data, right? Um, so I thought this is actually a very uh, interesting way of visualizing how machines think. This is from Louis Serrano from Udacity. Uh, he's, he was a machine learning engineer with Google. So 
the concept is you have this big spreadsheet here. How do you make sense of it? Like, okay, should I actually go out and play tennis if it is sunny and the weather is, uh, uh, sorry, if the wind is strong? It's, it's quite difficult to make sense of it. And so this is how a decision tree works. That's one of the algorithms in machine learning. So you start off with the thing that actually splits the data set most in half. And that's the outlook. Is it sunny? Is it overcast? Or is it rain? If it's sunny and there is humidity and the humidity is high, then you don't play tennis. If the humidity is low, yes, you can play tennis. If there's overcast, sure, go out and play tennis. If it's rainy and windy and the wind is strong, then don't. If it's weak rain, uh, sorry, if it's weak uh, wind, then you can. That's it's saying exactly the same thing as the spreadsheet, but in a way that's more, uh, that's easier to interpret. And that's actually one of the most powerful machine learning algorithms. Yeah. Question just on when you have, I guess, a large number of variables that you could pick, mm -hmm. how do you choose which ones to use? Do you have to kind of use statistical significance to see actually we use these five or six based on out of 20? Or? So with this particular one, um, you just look at which of these variables will be able to separate the data so that half of it uh, is, is in one camp and the other is another camp. A good example is this room here. If I were to split you up in a way I think it made the most sense, that would be male and female because the ratio is maybe 50%. So in, in a way where the, the first split you do has to be able to uh, split whatever population you're looking at in two equal sizes, right? And that's how it goes about it. It's not much to do with statistics or anything with significance. It's just how, how can I increase the information gain? So this is in computer science called entropy, um, but it's a bit beyond this uh, kind of primer to, to machine learning. Okay, so I wanted to show you how it works. Uh, so for linear regression, if you remember the bike sh sharing ride, uh, that was linear regression. You wanted to predict a number that was moving, right? So in this example, okay, I work uh, within the travel agency uh, or industry. So we have here on the y-axis, that's always the, uh, the variable you're trying to predict. So I want to predict what the gross bookings in US dollars is for a hotel room, okay? And the uh, feature that I'm going to use to predict it is based on the average user reviews on Google Maps. So the way that it works is I plot these in. So this means that particular hotel got, let's say, 0.8 in average uh, reviews out of five. So, and it only generated this low amount of revenue, okay? So every point is a unique uh, uh, example. And I'm gonna plot out the, the entire uh, graph here. So the way that machine learning works, and I'm sorry to tell you there's not a lot of magic, but uh, so yeah, so the way that it works is you plot them all out, and then you have this line that's going to be fitted in between somewhere. You have to figure out where that line should be. Anyone can, can anyone guess why you're gonna put a line there? What's that line for? Think about the 80, 20% split. What happens when we get new um, data, right? So, oh, we have another hotel room here and a third hotel room there. How much revenue is that hotel room going to predict? That's what the line is going to help us with. So if we put a random line, like I have done here, it's not in the middle. You can see in the middle would probably be here. But the way to evaluate how good that line is is you plot all the points out, you put down the line, sorry, you put down the line, um, yeah, you put down the line, and then what you do is you measure the distances uh, from each of those points to the line. So don't know, I think I made a mistake with, yeah. So what you do is you measure the distance, it looks a bit messy, but so for every point, you measure the distance down to the line, and then you add up all of those lines. And machine learning, what it does is it tries to move the line 
using gradient descent in mathematics to see where the perfect placement for the line is to reduce the sum of those errors. That's machine learning. And the way that it uh, can do that is if you improve the placement of the line. So this is a better line, right? Think of it uh, as balloons. <laughs> it actually does look like balloons. Um, you want to put the line in a place where when you add up all of those error lines, it's at the shortest distance as possible, okay? And this is the difference. So this is the prediction, and this is the true value of it. So an error is, of course, the difference between what our model predicted and what was really the truth, okay? So in this incident, our model predicted that if you have 2.8 reviews for your hotel room, it's gonna cost, let's say here, 10,000 US dollars. But in actuality, it costed, uh, or it generated more in revenue than $10,000. So that's how you measure the error. And then it moves the line in a different way to try and minimize that error, okay? That's actually how machine learning works. And this idea, this concept, linear regression, is I think uh, at least 50 years old, uh, maybe 80 years old from the 19, from the 1950s, so it's nothing new. But what has changed is the large amount of data that we have to be able to actually train our models on them. This is the concept of overfitting. So why did I draw a straight line instead of drawing a line across each of the values? Because this is 100% accurate, right? I mean, if you wanted to predict a hotel room that had 1.3 in review out of five, and it would only generate, um, let's say, 5,000 in revenue, you hit perfect. What do you think the problem is with this approach? What happens if you add a new data set? Let's say we add a new point here, a new hotel. How are you ever going to predict what that value is going to be? <laughs> because there's nothing to help you. Right? Whereas in, uh, before, if, uh, if you remember, um, before we actually had the line to tell us, sure, you have a new data point. Okay, where does it fit? How, what, uh, what was the review? Uh, the review was, let's say, four and a half. Okay, our model will tell you that this is the amount of revenue it's going to generate. But you don't have that when you've overfit your model to the training data. So. That's uh, how machine learning basically works. Oops, okay. If you remember from one of my first slides, we had supervised learning, unsupervised learning, and reinforcement learning. Unsupervised learning is when you have a lot of data, you don't know anything about it, okay? Say, something, say someone comes to your desk and drops a huge data set. There aren't even any column names or headers or labels, nothing. You don't know anything about it. So this evil person that drops it on your desk, he says, find insights. About what? I don't know. So this is where clustering actually comes in. Clustering, you give the machine some data, tell it, I don't know what's here. Go and find relationships. And the way it works is it will look at people, or oh, sorry, data points that are similar to each other. For example, in the example where you know, each of us went to product school and uh, signed up for this talk, uh, this is a labeled data set, meaning that we know whether you signed up or not. But how would I go about identifying what type of people actually signed up for this talk? This is where um, cluster analysis comes into play. So it looks at each uh, uh, one of us and groups them together and then sees, hmm, this section right here are very similar in demographics, are very similar in these variables. It doesn't know what the variables mean, but it groups them together in clusters. And then it says, so they must be related. To give you an example, if any of you have played FIFA or watched, actually even the, the World Cup. So if you played FIFA, uh, there are certain characteristics of people that play FIFA, right? 
say you work for EA, you want to advertise and attract more people that is going to buy FIFA. The way that you do it is you take the current data set you have and you tell the data scientist, okay, you've done your analysis, let the machine have its go at it. So they give him, uh, uh, or they, they, they deploy the machine learning algorithm, cluster, it's called clustering, on the data set, and then it analyzes the relationships so that someone that sits in advertisement can say, interesting, all of them have the common trait that they have liked um, Spice Girls on Facebook. Okay, interesting. So we're going to target them and send them. No offense to football fans. And uh, so we're going to target them heavily with ads. That's how clustering works. Another interesting uh, use case for cluster analysis on supervised learning is it's really an exploring uh, technique. You want to explore what your data set looks like without you muddying the water. So you deploy it and you see whether there are any relationships. Uh, I worked in a startup for a video game and we actually did this, or the data scientists did this, on uh, a data set to identify what type of personalities people were. And uh, it was able to group them in very unique play styles. These people here, they're very similar, very similar background, and they like to go adventuring. Right? These similar people, are, they are very similar to each other and dissimilar to this other cluster. And they are the people that like to fight in player versus player battles. And these people, uh, you know, they are quite lone wolves and they stick to e each other. But they are very similar in, uh, uh, in, uh, in the way that they play together, but also that they all came from Facebook and signed up to the game. So it's to, to, to tell you things you don't know about the data. That's how clustering works. And this is part of uh, unsupervised learning. Yeah? So do you sort of combine those, like use this approach to then find out what are actually the criteria which are interesting for supervised learning? Yes, that's a very good point, yeah. You could use that. Um, so usually in machine learning, if you have an idea you want to build out, you always start with EDA, exploratory data analysis. You have to understand the data set. Do you remember when uh, we talked about the age? It spanned from minus one to 115. Um, how did I find that? That was by exploring the data. So you get to learn the data set, right? I could also have then done unsupervised learning on the data set to learn more about the relationships of uh, these patients. But yes, absolutely, it's to help you actually understand who they are and what you are looking at. Reinforcement learning is probably one of the most hyped fields right now. Um, I'm going to show you a use case where uh, a lot of companies actually use it. Um, to drive business decision making in marketing and product. So the way that it works is imagine a robot, okay? This robot lives within an environment. So it could be here, we let loose a little Dyson robot to clean this uh, room here. So it exists only in a confined environment. So the robot, also called the agent, takes an action, it moves forward, right? analyzes the environment, and then something happens. It hits into a chair, like it, uh, it crashes into a chair. Then it will receive a negative reward. And this is your way of telling the machine learning agent, don't do that, right? Imagine you have a dog, shh, no, don't do that. I have cats at home. So it's all about you know, telling them what not to do and what to do even though they don't listen to it. But this is a very similar approach, or maybe even kids, if you have kids at home. You have to teach your kids, okay, you can walk freely in the room, but if your hand touches the stove, right, uh, and it's on, you will get your hands burned, so I'm going to uh, shout at you to tell you that is dangerous. So that the next time around, when the kid comes close to the stove and mommy's cooking or daddy's cooking, um, the kid knows already, okay, this is negative because I got a negative signal from uh, my parent. This is what's used uh, to power uh, self-driving cars. Actually, one of the projects I was working on was for MIT, where you had to build this car and it had to move in a traffic setting uh, in a way where you maximize the speed, but also not at a cost of security and safety, right? So it's the same technology that's used here. Any questions for reinforcement learning? Good. Okay. 
I'm going to be taking you through how to use machine learning now to power personalization. Just to define what I mean, personalization is the art of delivering a unique experience to Joshua um, and a unique experience to myself and a unique experience to any one of you when you go to Product School's website. So each one of us will see a layout that's uh, personally catered to us based on what we interact with. I don't care about events. I don't care about those expensive courses. I just, uh, you know, I want to see um, what's new on Slack. So the way to deliver personal, uh, personalized uh, search, or sorry, personalized results and personalization through machine learning is it will learn this about you and deliver those experiences to you. But before I do that, before I explain to you how that works, I'm going to tell you about the limitations currently. Uh, so many companies are talking about A-B testing and most companies have probably done a test or two themselves. But there are certain limitations when it comes to uh, A-B testing. Anyone work in a company that has run like online A-B tests? You all familiar with them? Cool. I got a bit unpopular uh, when I had this discussion with uh, some of our uh, stat uh, statisticians at work, but it's good to have these discussions. So the way it usually works when you go about hypothesis tests, you identify a problem, uh, you come up with a hypothesis for how to solve that problem, and in this particular uh, example, we come up with a hypothesis for how to use machine learning to improve that problem, okay? So it could be, all right, a lot of users are coming to the website, but, uh, and they see the sign-up form, but they leave. All right, what should we do? Okay, maybe there are too many fields. Let's slim it down. That could be uh, one of the ways to do it. Or maybe a lot of users that come from Spain, uh, they react very negatively to long booking forms. So they need to have it short, but people from the US are actually uh, uh, more closely correlated with uh, signups if the form is longer. So you have certain uh, hypotheses and you test for them. You identify then through the A-B test whether your new solution is better, and if it's better, then you deploy that to all, okay? However, that's a big issue because when you do A-B testing, this is how it looks like. 100% of traffic come to the website, you split out the traffic equally, and you wanna test these four different variants for uh, what, what they're called, uh, call to action buttons. Buy now, should, should it be the text buy now, or should the form be like this and the text add to cart, should it be pay now, or should it be this daily mail <laughs> uh, type of clickbait, right? Um, and then you then measure what the conversion rate is, uh, so the amount of people that, sorry, that should say uh, click-through rate, so the amount of people that see this particular uh, variant and clicks it, okay? And then you say, oh, that's interesting. So I've identified a winner. Let's push this out for the entire website to every user. This is actually problematic if you think about it. And the reason why it's problematic is because in a lot of the times when you had to display 25% of the traffic, right? So if you look at it here, 75% of the traffic were actually displayed inferior versions, right? If you have an e-commerce website and this variant is the best performing one and it took you a month to conclude this result, you still send 75% of the traffic to uh, lesser performing uh, variants. Does that make sense? This is actually uh, one of the biggest uh, limitations. I'm not going to use the word, uh, word weakness, but the biggest limitation with A-B testing is that it doesn't even care. One of them could even be bleeding money, but you need to keep running until the experiment finishes. Q for multi-armed bandits. A uh, very fancy way of saying, let's do a more clever approach. So multi-armed bandits, you start with the same, you split the traffic equally for, let's say, the first batch of visitors to your website. But then what you do is you note down the performance of these variants, and then you update your entire model to drive more traffic to the top performing variant, less to the lesser performing ones, right? 
And this continues. And the way that this works is, let's say within the first 100 users that visit your website, you know the baseline for how it performs, and then you change the business logic up here. This is dynamic. So even, even if this one was a false positive and it actually performed terrible, but we were just very lucky, the multi arm bandit would then update uh, the, the traffic split again. So you could actually run a multi arm bandit for eternity and it would still, in most cases, show the best performing variant. This is why multi arm bandits are in many, many, many situations much more prefer uh, preferable to uh, A-B testing. However, there are certain limitations. I'm not going to discuss them in too much depth, but if two variants are performing very identical, how is it going to identify a winner? And that's the limitation of uh, bandit uh, testing because it will keep trying, keep trying. It's, it's like this example. Um, I gave a talk at uh, Expedia not too long ago. Joshua was there as well, uh, where you know you want you want to go to you want to identify the best restaurant. You've just moved to London, like myself, and you go to all of these restaurants nearby. You write down, uh, you rate them on a scale from one to five, and then you go to them again. Did they receive a similar score? Okay, all right. Then I'm more certain that they are actually very good. Uh, but what if? They like it was terrible reviewed at first, but the second time, you know, they received a very good review from my experience. Then I updated, and I'll start going there uh, uh, more frequently. It's trying to mimic our behavior, and this is how multi-arm bandits work. It's from casinos, uh, basically. You have one thousand pounds. You uh, have a suspicion that one of these multi-arm bandits uh, has a higher payout. How do you go about identifying which one has a higher payout? You equally split the money to each one of them, note down which one drove the most uh, uh, revenue or returned the most uh, revenue, and then you invest more towards that arm. But still, every once and again, you invest in some of the lesser performing ones to make sure that they actually were terrible. But both of these actually have very strong limitations because what they are assuming is that there is such a thing as one winner. And that's actually not correct. If you think about it yourself, um, when you go to a restaurant, or actually if your mother came to ask you, recommend to me a restaurant, would that be the same restaurant you would recommend to your mother as to your partner, or as to your child, or as to a family that, that is uh, asking? You see, there are different situations, so that's not always one particular or it's not one size fits all winner, right? This is what the contextual bandits look at uh, solving. So this is an example of reinforced learning, uh, one of the most advanced forms of machine learning today. And I'm going to be giving you an example with a monkey named Kevin in a second. Uh, Multi-arm bandits, so you have an action and then you measure the reward. The action is, I'm going to these restaurants, I'm going to note down the reward of it. Or the action is, um, we are going to display this particular deal to our customer, and then we see uh, what the reward was, right? It can be used in so many different instances. Contextual bandits are extremely powerful because they have a third variable that they keep uh, track of. They look at the context. So, the context when it comes to uh, contextual bandits, in the example of a monkey that wants to maximize its banana rewards, um, you give it three different levers. Levers, 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 yeah. Uh, so the monkey pulls first lever and sees no banana. It pulls then the second lever, no banana, and then the third lever, and it gets banana. What do you think the monkey is going to do now? when it has those three levers in front of it again after it has eaten the banana. Which lever is it going to pull? Go to the third. Absolutely, because it knows, oh, this is how it works. That's how multi-arm bandits work. They are actually very stupid. There's not much intelligence behind it. However, the contextual bandits, <clears throat> oh, yeah. And 
uh, like the gentleman said, it's just going to keep pulling that lever because it thinks uh, this, is, this has the highest reward. So the contextual bandits are what is going to be powering the most amount of personalization for users. Uh, this is what's called individuals at scale. So it's able to cater your user experience on a website uniquely to you based on what you interact with and you appreciate the most um, and uniquely so for the gentleman here. It's completely different for everyone based on what they prefer. Um, and usually when, when you explain how, how that works, most people you know, really want to learn how machine learning works and apply it themselves. But just before I go there, the way that they work is they actually observe. So it's like multi arm bandits, but they observe any context. Um, so for example, when I use Amazon, when I'm on the train, the underground train, I will be looking at tech gadgets. And during my lunch break, I'll probably look at household items like cat food or something like that, cat toys. And then when I get back home again, I may look at tech gadgets again. The way that it works, if you think about the supervised learning example, the big spreadsheet, is the machine learning agent says, very interesting, Emma, when he is connected to the underground Wi-Fi net, his behavior changes completely and he looks at these things. So that next time Emma is connected to the underground Wi-Fi internet, we are going to show him these results, okay? And we also noticed that around 6.30 p.m., when he's connected to a Wi-Fi network called home, his behavior changes completely in terms of what he then looks at. From an app to a browser, and it also looks at the times, and it says, all right, I'm going to customize the recommendations to him based on these variables. You see, this is how personalization is actually being uh, driven under our nose. We don't even know it's happening. We just think, oh, there, Amazon is getting very clever at customers, has also bought this. Oh, that's very interesting. That's actually how it's powered. And um, more and more companies are using this. Um, and I deliberately don't want to make this a Hotels.com propaganda session. So I'm, I'm just neutrally explaining to you how these things work so you're more aware of them uh, in the future when you want to build your products. Do those contexts need to be known beforehand? No. It's intelligent enough to... Exactly. It's, you don't tell it anything. It just notices that the, if, you, if, we go all the, oh, sorry. if we go all the way back, it just notices that the correlation changes for when you actually convert that's quite far. Um, it just, yeah, it, it just notices that, you know what? It's very interesting. Um, when you change some of these variables, uh, this particular user actually converts at this particular time. If you think about it from advertisement perspective, it's going to be extremely powerful. If you are able to identify that within this time slot, if I deliver an ad to this user at this per, uh, uh, exact time, then they are 70% more likely to buy my products. That's very scary. But it, it observes the patterns. You don't give it patterns. It just observes it, it themselves. Again, it's not magic. It's all statistics. It's all about correlation. When does the correlation for you buying change? And this is what it analyzes in, in real time, or observes in real time. And it thinks several steps ahead, like, oh, if I show them a cat at 12 o'clock and then you know, something else at three, then I'm going to buy at six. With this yes, that's exactly, that's exactly how it would do. Because it <coughs> looks at your previous behavior, and uh, maybe it doesn't even care about your previous behavior. Maybe let's say, what's your name? Yulin. Yulin. Maybe it says, okay, Yulin is very similar to Amma. When she goes uh, online on Amazon at this particular time, she's bought similar items that he has, but this particular item she has not bought. So I'm going to recommend it to her when she's on the train and she's browsing Amazon. I'm going to deliver that to her. That's unsupervised learning. Remember that? Because this is a recommendation engine. You say, uh, you have listened to these songs on Spotify. So has this other user. But there's one song that you haven't listened to and rated. 
but the other user has. So I'm going to recommend it to you because you're most likely going to. Um, but I mean, are there such um, systems which uh, try to change your context actually? For example, oh, I'm going to frustrate you into trying to buy something, so then maybe she will buy it better or more expensive later or something like that. Yeah, so yeah, it, it, it happens quite a lot actually. Um, so in the games industry, they are a bit more advanced on that front. Um, when it comes to monetization, if any of you have played mobile games, you come to a certain point where you're like, oh, now it wants me to pay to progress. But they've already hooked you and you're like, I really don't want to wait six hours to get this power up or this booster. So I'm just going to pay to remove my frustration. This is because there are teams of psychologists that analyze your behavior, right? Uh, I wrote a blog post about this and it didn't get published in, uh, the, in uh, some newspaper because it was, I, I wanted parents to actually know what their kids are being exposed to by uh, experimental psychologists, which is why, uh, partly also why I left the games industry. So yes, absolutely. And it's, it's a big uh, playground for many of these companies, sadly. Facebook, uh, not too long ago, I think it was a year ago, they decided to run a big experiment where the users would become more depressed if they showed them, I think it was like emojis or something like that. And uh, they did the experiment without telling anyone. I mean, that's a bit uncomfortable, right? Uh, so you have the power to make people depressed and more happy. And you decided to do an experiment on, on uh, uh, how you can see, uh, see whether you can impact depression. So. It's, it's a very messy uh, uh, playground. And I think also it's, it's, it's part of this intellectual self-defense of learning machine learning. When I see I'm on Amazon, and then I go back to Facebook, and then Facebook starts recommending to me the pro uh, products I've just looked at. Many of you have probably seen that yourself. It's because they are connected, uh, and it knows my uh, browsing patterns there, and therefore recommends it back to me. Actually. Um, I've done some web scraping where you can, so web scraping is going to a website and mimicking a Google search. Google search jumps to all websites and downloads all the information and then updates it algorithms. So you can mimic that same process and download information from competitors. Uh, but some of the interesting aspects was when a user visits uh, a website and they have another tab open with Facebook and the third tab open with tw Twitter, we can actually see that. We can see whether you are also logged into Facebook, even though you don't, uh, even though you haven't given us any permission. That's because of something called Fav icon. There's a little icon when you visit uh, the website that we have on you, and it's this is part of why machine learning is so important, um, and and learning about it because you'll be able to protect yourself um, against maybe more uh, evil-minded. Uh, people that want to harness you for psychology reasons. Uh, think about the uh, Cambridge Analytica scandal as well. That was a survey, uh, an app that you know surveyed users about uh, their preferences and then used it to target them for advertisement. It's it's not everyone in the world that uh, has been brought up correctly. Um, sorry, I, I know it's been a bit of a long day, but uh, we are getting towards the end now. And the end is really where I want you to be more realistic about this. Uh, in fact, this was actually told to me by a senior data scientist that wanted to motivate me to learn machine learning. Uh, and she was grinning like very evilly in the background, but it, it's not just five lines, trust me. It's, it's, it's a big science behind it. But before you actually decide to learn machine learning, this is a chart that really, really helped me very, very much. Uh, this goes to not just machine learning, but learning in general. You want to learn a new language, you want to learn how to uh, play the piano. It always follows this pattern. So this pattern is in the beginning, when you start learn, you will be uh, you know, hand held throughout many of the exercises, especially in programming. They are going to write a lot of code uh, and ask you, oh, input your little snippet here and write a lot more other code so that when you click run, oh, wow, I did a lot of machine learning. But in fact, someone actually, an engineer did that for you so you could feel cool. So a lot of hand-holding 
which gives you fake confidence. And then you're like, all right, I want to do this, uh, my own project and, you know, get on with it. And then you're like, wait, where do I start? <laughs> and then you're like, oh, I actually know nothing, right? And this is where you are going to be spending most of your time, honestly. Most of your time, if you decide to learn machine learning, is going to be tanking here. And this is a test of your mental uh, ability to persist in something that's difficult, especially with uh, coding. I think I have probably tried to learn how to code 30 or 40 different times from different websites until I finally got up and running. And I bothered uh, the, the startup I was working in, the web developers, oh, can you just look at this here, right here, and I'm stuck here, can you? But I then started to be able to code, and uh, it's, it's a tremendous joy that you can actually pull it off. And I think uh, from Temi's uh, uh, introduction earlier that they don't want to build you as a web developer, that's very good uh, disclaimer to, to, to give uh, to people that are learning to, to code. But then what happens is you then start to realize, okay, I can actually do this. I'm, I built my own model. I can predict whether someone is not going to show up for a medical appointment and I understand what I've done. More and more confidence and then you get to where you are with being job ready. So please take this as a disclaimer that expect uh, to be down there for a lot of time. I probably spent two years down there and that was w with having a mentor as well. And I thought I had... Uh, difficulties with learning um, and she was just laughing at me and saying are oh, you silly but okay so let's start off with what not to do the worst you can do is say oh, all of these machine learning courses say I need to learn linear algebra I need to have control of, uh, of calculus derivatives uh, chain rule this oh wow like okay so I'm going to go on Khan Academy and I'm going to go through everything that's the worst thing you can do uh, because it kills the joy, it kills the excitement of, you know, trying to learn something new. Uh, so don't do that. And this is a, an interesting quote. Um, it's actually a true quote that, you know, it's such, like the multi-armed bandits that I was showing you earlier, the math that goes behind it <laughs> is something that they were considering to drop over Germany, um, the Allies, uh, because it was just intellectual sabotage. So don't, don't try to intellectually sabotage yourself. And also don't isolate yourself. Um, go to talks, meet other like-minded people. Uh, if you work with people that are already coding, uh, ask them questions. Um, and I think that's one of the most important parts that you don't just limit it to you being at home, sitting behind a screen and coding, because that takes the joy out of it. Maybe I should have put complete idiot, uh, because you will feel like a complete idiot uh, when you start this. You feel like that you wasted a lot of your time and, you know, wow, I know nothing. Yeah? Are you saying that it's the coding side that's the complicated bit or the ML side of it? Of, of what, sorry? Of this learning ML. I'm saying that the theory behind it, the mathematical concepts, are so heavy, right? If, like, for, for example, uh, I failed college math when uh, I was younger. And uh, I then retook math again and failed it. So for me, my journey was much longer than any of you. I mean, if I show you my Khan Academy, Khan Academy I started from third grade going all the way up to uh, college level and then to university level and it, it, it takes the fun out of it. Um, so don't start with the theory. And instead, what I'm going to be recommending is start applying machine learning, even though you know that they are holding your hand, just start applying it. Um, and then as you're applying it, ask curious questions. That is the best thing you can do. I, I wonder why this particular algorithm had a higher accuracy than, than, than that one. I'm going to show you in a bit uh, some of my own notes and, and lessons uh, learned. Um, and when you study one concept, don't try to rush through it. Really try to understand it, master it. Make sure that you can explain it even to uh, a kid, right? Um, Think about it when, when you're interviewing with companies, they often ask you, oh, uh, try to sell me this pen, uh, you know, uh, or try to do this or explain that, uh, explain databases to a kid. Like I had that one question when I interviewed with Facebook ages ago. Like, 
okay, right? So if you don't really understand it, then you can't explain it to a kid. Uh, so, so try to really make sure you understand these concepts, and particularly these concepts here. Uh, this is basics in machine learning. You don't need to take any pictures. Um, and actually, this is true. Um, pretty depressing, but 50 online courses, 40-something uh, certificates, 150 Kindle books uh, that I've read through, even more hours of YouTube. <clears throat> and I've, I've really gone through everything that you can mistake. So this is kind of uh, the lessons that I draw for a moment. Uh, all right, that's not the one, sorry. Um, yeah, this is basically the best path you can take to learn machine learning. Intro to Machine Learning by Udacity. It's taught by Google X founder, uh, so uh, Sebastian Thran. He, is the, he was leading a Google X division and decided to just quit his role and set up this company to teach people uh, all of these computer science and machine learning. It's very cool because he's one of the founders of self-driving cars and he explains it to you in his own uh, words and very simplified and you can tell this guy knows what he's talking about because he's able to explain it so that even kids understand. But as you go through the course, don't think that you've actually mastered those concepts because they are much deeper. The good news is that this book here, uh, Python Machine Learning, um, has almost an identical structure to the course. So every lesson that you go through, uh, and particularly lesson 10 to 15, has an equivalent chapter in the book, and it's explained much more in detail with code and the reasoning why it works like this, and um, kind of the, some of the mathematical notation. Don't, don't you know, pass out because you see some mathematical notation, but it's very, very light on theory and more practical. And then this is actually one of the best books I have ever read in terms of uh, statistics. I... Uh, I have a bachelor's degree in marketing and I deliberately steered away from statistics because it was just so dry. What he does here is he explains how politicians, they manipulate statistics so that when they want to talk about economical growth, they always use the mean because the mean is very prone to outliers. You know, for instance, uh, let's say my salary is 20,000, your salary is 20,000 and then Bill Gates comes into the room and the average salary for us goes up to, let's say, 200 million. But that doesn't mean anything. That doesn't mean there is more wealth created in society. And instead, what, they, what he shows is he says, this is why they don't use the median. The median looks at, okay, so you have three values. It's always the middle value, which would be 20,000 and more representative of that sample. It's very, very cool. And you get to understand how statistics can apply to the real world. Uh, so I recommend you reading it or uh, buying it as an audiobook. It's available. Once you've done that and you're pumped, you know, you're really excited, um, keep this in mind. So as you go through these different <coughs> concepts in machine learning, look it up on Quora. See what some experts are saying. Go to YouTube. Uh, watch a YouTube video for someone to explain it from a different angle. This particularly multi arm bandits took me so long to understand how they work. Um, so try and listen, uh, hear it from different angles and from different speakers uh, until it really settles in. And also, uh, it's just an advice from myself. I've, I've noticed this with a lot of people that get uh, into machine learning and um, they don't want to ask questions that put them in a negative light to show that, oh, we don't know anything about machine learning. So they will pretend, oh, you've used this algorithm. Oh, I see. Oh, so you've reduced this uh, loss function right here. And they have no idea what they're talking about. But they want to sound knowledgeable. However, it, their, their ego actually prevents them from learning from those people that they are speaking with. So don't prevent yourself from uh, growing and learning from experts. Be very humble. Uh, I had a discussion recently about with, with one of the data scientists look, man, what is the definition of machine learning? I know it on paper, but what's the difference between fitting a line like I was showing you there? Uh, because that's from like the 70 years ago and then machine learning today. And we had a big discussion and he was even confused because there's a lot of hype around these things and 
you should know that the idea that you have is probably something someone else also had. Uh, so don't uh, rob yourself of that opportunity. And don't go to deep learning. Uh, deep learning is when you have massive amounts of data. And uh, that's where it really shines. It outshines some of these other um, machine learning models. Maybe you only have 300 rows of data. That's fine for machine learning. You can still apply that and analyze it and get some kind of meaningful uh, data, but don't. And deep learning is going to take so long and it's so uh, uh, resource intensive on your computer. It's gonna make your laptop uh, boil. Don't do it. Um, there's no point in doing it yet, right? Master machine learning first. And then try and take notes of everything that you thought, aha, that was a really nice explanation. Just to give you an example. This is my machine learning notebook. Everything is something I've taken in hand. Statistics, correlation, what was it? How, what's the difference between positive and negative? Uh, what's Bayes' theorem here? Um, I'm just gonna zoom in. Gradient descent, how did that work? What's bag of words? Oh, this is how it looks like when you split sentences by words, okay. Uh, Cross-validation. Uh, what are different ways of assessing whether something is accurate or, um, uh, you know, otherwise? Like, for instance, say I build a model that is 99% accurate in predicting whether an email is spam. Would you say that's a good model? It's one of those questions where you really are hesitant about answering it because you know I wouldn't ask you that obvious question. It depends because if 99% of your emails are all non-spam, then you could just build a dumb model that would predict every email you receive is non-spam and it would be 99% accurate. So accuracy as a metric doesn't even matter, right? There are different ways of evaluating uh, accuracy as a concept. Um, and these just throughout, this is what I've gone through my, uh, myself and taken notes of, nothing is copied all in my own words uh, to, to really make it easier for me to revisit and especially when I have to give a talk on these concepts. Um, so actually, yeah, you notice uh, the same uh, chart here that I had in, in the presentation. Uh, and that's just my machine learning notes. I mean, this is data analysis. Uh, statistics are even crazier because I think it was 50 pages. So make sure you document everything. And it, it means that once you revisit it, it's going to be fresh in your mind again. Uh, it's the best way of, of going about learning. Okay, we are getting close now. Oh, that's not the one presentation, that's the other. Okay. And try and team up with other people that are like-minded. If you decided earlier from today's talk that you wanna learn machine learning, Maybe there are others nearby that want to do the same. Maybe there is a Slack <laughs> channel for, for people in London that wants to learn. You never know. Um, be curious. Look around. There are many events, especially in London, for people uh, like yourself. And find a mentor, right? I, uh, have, I have had six mentors in the past. They were all my colleagues. And I used to buy them gifts when I mastered a concept that I was really struggling with. So uh, I used to buy them a 50 pound Amazon uh, voucher, like, thank you. And they were like, what? Why are you buying us gifts? It's normal, other people ask us questions all the time. But because you have to celebrate the mastery of a concept, make it fun, right? And show them your appreciation uh, of, of their time and effort that they invested this in you and you really wanna celebrate that you mastered it. Um, and actually, on that point, I'm very happy to mentor you without any gifts. Um, I've mentored 80 people uh, in transitioning into data science roles, online and offline and through meetups. So I love it. Um, just reach out. Uh, there's gonna be a contact slide if you're interested. So finally, some of the topics because we ran out of time. Uh, that we didn't cover uh, is uh, what type of problems can be solved. We did touch upon it uh, a bit with classification and regression and reinforcement learning. But um, if you do have some of these questions, uh, up to you to ask now.
Um, there is a different level of mastery of the concept depending on what we want to do, right? Uh, so some yeah. of us would want to become data scientists, uh, and some others would be like, oh, I just want to understand enough to be able to grasp the concept, the possibilities, and so on. So um, how to know, how to learn, depending on what your goal is, because mm. what you presented is like if we want to be the same as you, but maybe it's a, it's a bit of an overview for some of us. Sure. How else can we do the best approach is by starting with a breadth, like a very broad spectrum. So you, uh, you study the different concepts of machine learning. You don't have to go into much depth, but if you have a curious mind and you're like, oh, that was very interesting. Like one of the concepts, dimensionality reduction, it's very interesting in machine learning. You have a huge data set with many columns, but it's gonna take your model so long to actually use all of those columns in uh, predicting. So what you do is you take away all of the useless concepts that don't help uh, improve the accuracy. And this is very similar to when you have, like I take a, a high quality photo of you, but when I send it to your email, I'm gonna compress it. There's no need for it to be five megabyte, but it's still almost the same quality. And it's the same here. So if you, get, if you find yourself more curious into diving down deeper, uh, then you will find out with yourself as well that oh, maybe I have a scientist mind, um, even though you may not have that uh, trajectory through your education. It's, it's, I think the best way is sit down, look at it. If you want to understand it from a product management perspective that you are going to work with engineers, perfectly fine. But you still need to go through the different concepts to have that appreciation. And then further down the line, you can decide. I didn't make up my mind when I started studying. Um, I could have gone both ways, either a data scientist or just a product manager with an appreciation of machine learning. But at least when you are further down the line, you can then make that decision yourself. Um, if, you, if you start making suggestions based on this ML, how do you stop the following behavior from influencing, you know, because you're introducing a sort of bias in and if you continue to evaluate it, you're going to be steered in that particular direction. It depends uh, what, what the, the example is. For example, if you find out that people uh, that have liked different pages on Facebook react positive to an ad, are you going to recommend other people to like that page so that they also respond to your ad? Or is that purely coincidental, right? So it's not always about changing behavior. To give you an example, people come to a website, they all interact with, let's say, the filters. So a product manager gets a clever idea, okay, let's promote those filters, because this is the trait and behavior of very profitable customers. That's a big mistake. That's in statistics, you know, saying that correlation does not equate causation. Uh, it may just be a trait they have, but has no impact on uh, the reasons why they are actually uh, highly profitable. There are many different uh, use cases, but I, I think you would have to ask a more specific example if you had one in mind. Um, I'm just thinking from the, the work that I'm in at the moment uh, and how we could apply this um, in uh, a risk management perspective. So by tracking the way that people enter data into the system, if you started making suggestions to the about what else they could consider. Once they start doing that, then you you start steering the kind of data that they're entering. Mm -hmm. You end up with feedback you get from the century. Yeah, but so so what could the consequence of that be? What, what's what's the fear? You could be influencing their decision making. Well, that's why many people are hired in business to optimize for conversion, right? I mean, it, it's basically looking at it from different sides. Either you take the position of the user and say, you know what, I'm not going to influence the user and make it easier for him or her to convert and buy my product. But then you can't work in business, right? Or you're going to say, I'm going to optimize that user journey to the extent where... Uh, they are more likely to end up buying our product, but you've still then influenced that behavior, right? So it's, it, it depends how you look at it. Um, but machine learning is all about helping people buy your product, basically. So 
So um, I'm curious to have your perspective on, um, so during all this we try to put order into people's behavior, but what if actually people don't want or are not ordered or don't want order into their behavior? One example is uh, recently with the GDPR, so they, they ask you, do you actually want us to collect all this data in order to give you a better, more personal yeah. experience? And I found myself being like, no, actually I don't want a personal experience, I just want to do my own thing and wander around and so I want to see what happens. Exactly. I think that's the balance. So. In many European uh, states, the law and legislation is viewed as the necessary evil. But in fact, it's not a necessary evil. It's to protect the people from corporations that have the objective of pure profitability. I mean, if, if you have this all-out profitability focus, uh, the corporations are going to not just destroy the environment, maybe some of you are aware of it, and pollute the environment, um, they can have their full say just to generate profitability. This is more maybe a philosophical discussion about capitalism and its impact on uh, how uh, profitability is the only, oh sorry, how uh, um, revenue <coughs> is the only uh, material value that's appreciated. There's nothing called ethics per se. There's nothing called morals. Uh, at least it's being reduced uh, and you see that especially in the States. But it's, it's a very difficult area to traverse. One of the points I'm uh, sp uh, particularly following is in reinforcement learning, you have to teach the machine learning agent what's right and what's wrong. But how can you do that when we as humans can't even agree on right and wrong? When is it right to take the life of uh, an infant? When, is it, when does it have a soul? When doesn't it have a soul? When should abortion be, you know, uh, forbidden at what point in the pregnancy. There are so many issues. Should uh, uh, ca uh, cannabis be legalized? Shouldn't it be legalized? So if you as a uh, society cannot agree on what's right and wrong, how are you going to teach an agent what's right and wrong? This is why you have a lot of bias being introduced, like you mentioned earlier as well. Um, like that bias, you are introducing it to a machine and then you think the machine is being objective. It's not. It's being trained by subjective individuals. If those individuals happen to have some racism in them or happen to have some concepts that are going to uh, steer them in one direction, it's going to impact how that agent operates. For example, Facebook, uh, there were several reports that they uh, penalized right-wing posts and uh, promoted left-wing material. Is that right? Is that like between right and wrong? How, how can you even prove that that's right? I'm not saying that it should promote more right wing, but at least have that discussion, right? So it, it opens up a lot more philosophical conversations. And as a political activist myself, this is a very interesting conversation uh, to be had. And I don't think people can uh, come to a conclusion with it. Um, and the difference is if you as a parent raise your child in a wrong way, it's going to have a limited negative impact on society. But if you're going to be building AI agents who are massively going to impact hundreds and millions of users, you really need to be sure what the engineers are putting down there in the code and the way that they train them. Can you talk about uh, next big opportunities for this video? I can't because I didn't uh, send this past their uh, communication. Um, so I, that's why I wanted, yeah, so, so this is very interesting. The travel agency is, I think, undergoing a lot of uh, innovation currently um, with chatbots. They are now, you think you're interacting with a customer service agent, but in most cases, if you go to the top leading uh, online agencies, you're actually engaging with a chatbot. Um, so there's a lot of ways of, of optimizing that. Um, and also I think with search, so if you go and look for property, you are with a child, you know, you enter two adults, one child, you want the search results to be customized for, 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 for that. Uh, what if you're looking at the reviews of a hotel? I don't really care. That could be teenagers or 
65 plus, they are not relevant for uh, me and my wife and my kids, for example, as, as a hotel review. So I want to see reviews that are custom tailored for people like me, right? So there is so much room for, for optimization uh, when it comes to machine learning. Um, and I, I think that's actually one of the, the main reasons I wanted to transition away from games industry. Because in the games industry, if you're really good at your job as a product manager or data scientist, you create addicted players, right? Um, in the online travel agency, if you're really good at product management and machine learning, you get to send people out to experience the world and probably combat these isolationist policies like Brexit, like uh, uh, the wall, all of these things, right? So it, there's much more positive behind it. Um, and that's why it, it, it feels good to think creatively about how we can get more people traveling and uh, see other cultures. Okay, so feel free to reach out. That's my email, it's my LinkedIn, and I am uh, a bit active on Quora where I write about these topics, the intersection between product management and machine learning. And again, if you need a mentor to help you, whether that's through coding or through data science, data analysis, um, don't hesitate with reaching out. Thank you so much for being here today, and I really appreciate it.